this morning's session is Dr. Nicole Emerson, who's passing around some, some documents there. Uh, she was she works with uh, Whatcom County uh, Conservation District, and as a nutrient management and air quality specialist. How this session came about is last fall, a group of us were talking on the on the phone and trying to um, get our uh, get our heads around what is what, what are some of the big topics related to nutrient management and what do we want to bring bring forward at this conference here today. Right about that time, those of us on the on the cell phone call, and I'm sure many of you we're in the midst of discussions within our states on adaptations to the 590 standard. Going through different reviews, going through different discussions um, and revisions. Personally speaking, one of the things that came, kept coming up in our discussions in South Dakota is, well, what is Iowa doing? What is Minnesota doing? How can we, uh, should we be doing the same thing in South Dakota? Should we be doing something slightly different? So this is, um, this is how this idea came about. How could we facilitate a look at nutrient management planning, similarities and differences across the country, but um, more importantly, how can we cooperatively inform decision-making processes um, in the future? I know in the room here we have several researchers, we have several uh, extension and outreach specialists, and we have several technical service providers. How can we work together um, to maybe answer some of the questions that were um, dogging us this time around and thinking to the future five years from now, what do we think are some questions that we're going to need to answer then. So using this national 590 standard as a template, our panel discussion today is nutrient management standards, making them work where we work. I'm pleased to introduce our panel members uh, who joined us here today from across the country. They represent both NRCS and Extension Outreach um, from uh, with various uh, perspectives. On, on my end here, we have Melanie Wilson, who's with the Animal and Dairy Science, uh, who is an Animal and Dairy Science Public Service Representative at the University of Georgia. We have Laura Pebble, who is um, a Livestock Extension Specialist with um, University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. We have Jim Sharkoff, State Conservation Agronomist with the USDA NRCS in Colorado here. And at the far end of the table, we have Bond Habits, who's the State Resource Conservationist with the NRCS in Washington State. So our panel spans the whole country here um, from east to west, and we're really glad that they could join us and share their insights as to what is happening in their particular neck of the woods. So over the next hour, what we're going to focus on is some of the overarching concepts um, of the 590 plan. Now, we won't have an opportunity to get through all the state differences for every single question within this hour, but we hope to focus on where we see some of the, some of the big differences across states. Um, Dr. Dr. Emerson has just dis distributed a, a sheet. We don't have one for everyone, unfortunately. However, online, we do have an electronic version of this, of this form, and it's linked to um, to the proceedings for this particular panel. So everyone should be able to access that during the conference here and after the conference. So we have a summary from not only our panel states here, but from I think almost 20 states across the country, looking at some of these overarching concepts. So with those, with the panel's input and the input in that form, what we want you to do is keep in mind over this next hour is what are some of the issues that are coming to mind, maybe to you, or maybe there are some issues in your state, so that when we come back after the break, we can look at some opportunities to move forward together to address some of these issues cooperatively and scientifically. How many in the room are familiar with 590? I know what I mean when I say 590. So for the most part, um, most part it is, but in basic terms, it is a standard developed through the NRCS as a foundation for consistent and responsible nutrient management planning. Those nutrients in, a, in our context are typically manure, but it can be uh, commercial fertilizer or other form of nutrients. 
So while it's a national standard consisting of the shalls and shoulds, you know, the, the criteria and the considerations, the national standard is designed with wiggle room so that states can adopt things that are specific to their region, specific to their state, and, and, such, and as such, we expect and we do see differences across state lines when it comes to uh, both interpreting and implementing this standard. So to emphasize that point, um, one of the first things that I wanted the panel to quickly address, give a minute or two introduction, is how or what does the role of the 590 standard play in your state? Melanie, do you mind starting us off? Not at all. Good morning. Uh, in Georgia, um, the 590 standard is basically used by NRCS. Um, for those of us outside of NRCS, we um, have our regulations and we have nutrient management plans that we utilize. But um, typically, unless you have an NRCS plan developed, most of our planners um, do not use the 590 in Georgia. Um, uh, for Illinois, the um, very similar to Georgia, the actual 590 standard is primarily used by NRCS or technical service providers in the state. However, um, NRCS in Illinois has made an effort to make sure that the, the specific requirements as to the, the maximum amount of, um, of nitrogen or phosphorus that can be applied mimics what the current regulations are in the state. So the 590 standard isn't necessarily forcing producers to do something that's different than current regulation. It just forces more producers to utilize those regulations that are currently in place. And Colorado's in the same boat. I, the, the nutrient standard that uh, 590 represents uh, the planning criteria for uh, nutrient plans that NRCS is technically responsible. And that's I have to say in Washington, um, the state regulatory agencies are involved, um, as it says in the standard, the state water quality authorities will give some guidance. As in Washington, it says do not pollute. There are no set minimums, maximums, nothing. It just says don't pollute. So we're trying to come up with some kind of a balance of what we could do that. Now, I just wanted to just, just mention this one thing. We, it's kind of a gray area because these standards are not meant to be used for regulatory purposes. So it's, it's kind of a, um, a hard line. We deal with systems, and so you whether you have filter strips or lagoons or all that deals with how you're going to manage your nutrients. So it's a system, too, that we need to add those to. Um, and I, um, I think there was something else I was going to mention, but I think that was that's good for now. Before we go on, can everybody hear the back there? Everybody can hear all the speakers effectively? So maybe speakers, if we can um, try and speak a little bit louder, too. For you, <laughs> <laughs> if everybody can just try and speak a, bit, a little bit louder, we have a really full house here today. <clears throat> As part of um, the national standard came out there in the beginning of, of 2012, and so through the through the course of 2012, um, most of our states then took an opportunity to look at that and make any necessary re revisions or adaptations specific to our regions or our individual states. What I wanted the, the panel to address next is what process did your state use to, to consider and develop provisions to the National 590 standard? Laura, can you um, take this question first? Uh, sure. Uh, so the, the process in Illinois started um, back in last May. Uh, an invite went out to most of the stakeholders um, in the, the state that would be interested in the 590 standard. That included um, livestock groups, uh, Farm Bureau, uh, Fertilizer Institute, as well as um, we have some environmental groups that are fairly active when it comes to um, livestock and nutrient management issues in the state of Illinois. So they brought us all together in a room um, and laid it out into, well, I guess broke it down into committees. So we had four areas and then offered to allow the stakeholders in the, the state to actively participate on those committees to put forth their input on, on the standard revisions. Uh, the four committees were uh, revisions to the actual standard, the 590 standard itself, uh, the development of the nitrogen guidelines, um, as well as the, the P-index tool 
uh, the development of one because we didn't have one prior to this. And then an adaptive management um, committee that basically allows, uh, if a producer feels that the standard won't allow him to achieve the yields or the objectives that he wants on his operation, then he has the opportunity to use adapt adaptive management techniques to um, prove that his farm is different from the mean um, in Illinois. So it sounds like a fairly complex process to move forward with. How long did the process take? Uh, we just got the, uh, the final standard last Friday. So um, about eight or nine months, pretty long process. Is there anything in particular that um, helped or hindered the process? Uh, I'd say the, the, <laughs> the variety of folks sitting in the room definitely um, did not expedite the process <laughs> at all. There was, <laughs> there was a lot of <laughs> bickering back and forth, I guess. Um, it, it, we really didn't get moving until January where they decided to pull in the primary industry or stakeholders separately uh, rather than as a community effort. Uh, the community effort wasn't uh, very effective in our state. Thank you. Melanie, do you want to touch on how, how Georgia went about this, this process? The charge to revise the 590 standard went out to our state soil conservationist and um, I have to say he, he is really good about contacting the University of Georgia and if you look at our 590 standard it refers to the University of Georgia official recommendations frequently. Um, he got a group of us together, both extension professionals and our researchers, the researchers that's been key people who developed our phosphorus index and is involved greatly in nutrient management in our state. And we had emails going back and forth. He sent us the national standard, asked us for our input. Um, and we had a couple of sit down meetings face to face. But tip, most of our meetings was just university and an RCS personnel. I have a, a question to the, to the rest of the group here. How many people in this room were involved with revisions or discussion related to their own state's 590 standard? So a handful of people. My next question starts getting into some of the nuts and bolts of, of what's hand, oh, sorry, what's included in this 590 standard, some of the, the shells in there, and that's, you know, there should be or shall be. Uh, phosphorus risk assessment as part of a nutrient as part of nutrient management planning. So Jim, if I can pass this question on to you first, what does your state use for a phosphorus index, and can you elaborate a little bit on, on why you got that route? Sure. Um, it was about 20 years ago when uh, Lemunian and Gilbert proposed uh, one of the first phosphorus indexes that. But it's the one that the agency adopted, I think, in, in 93, that went out as a, uh, uh, a technical node out of our West National uh, Technology Center. And so this was about 20 years ago, and, and we had some people at, at Colorado State University who were interested in this and kind of seeing where things were going with uh, the options for threshold phosphorus and soil test phosphorus. And the index was really a logical way to go to provide our cooperators with more options to use management to uh, minimize the risk associated uh, with, with these systems as opposed to using soil test phosphorus or a threshold P. So um, CSU started looking at uh, phosphorus concentrations in, in tailwater uh, there in probably 97, 98, 99. And, and then going backwards and looking at this original index, and okay, which, which of these original index factors had, had an influence uh, on the phosphorus concentration that they're seeing in the runoff? And then we came up with a, a set of factors that made sense for, for what we were doing here in Colorado. So it's, it's essentially an adoption an adapt adaptation of the original index uh, from Lemonian and Gilbert is what we're using. Vonda, can you address what's going on with, with Washington and what you use for a key index? And maybe also, I believe you're involved with the Sarah 17 group. 
Um, actually, I am not, but uh, we have formed a committee. We are um, re looking at our at the template, actually. Uh, we had the same phosphorus index rules, the same template that Colorado was using in Washington. Um, I think a lot of the Western states have the same template. But we're actually looking at doing something a little bit differently for this next for this next revision, I guess you'd say. So we aren't really sure what the the end result is going to be, but it's it's using a lot of the um, there was a APET or is it Apex model or something like that. So we're looking at um, a different way of looking at things. So it isn't the weighted factors like it was before. So we do have a couple people on our committee, our technical committee, that are also work on the CR17. Um, I guess as advisory and so every phosphorus index within probably the next two years or so are going to have to be reviewed by the CR17 as to their quality and they'll have to you know if they're not they, they don't pass muster they'll have to go back and revamp it so we're trying to have that knowledge up front so as we're working uh, Washington is working with Oregon at the same time they have a eastern Washington and Oregon and a, and a western Washington and Oregon phosphorus index so um, it's it's kind of where the states are real similar in, in the climate and the and the diversity, um, so they're kind of staying with that same guidance. So we're working with uh, um, both universities in Washington and Oregon to help us as a technical group. And again, we had to take out a lot of the <coughs> regular committee of people because they you know they were just getting too far into the weeds, we weren't getting any progress. So we're just starting to meet. And we hope we don't haven't posted the standard yet, but we hope to get to it at, um, in July. <coughs> Melanie, can you discuss um, whether it's related directly to the 590 or just how, it, how exactly you address phosphorus? Georgia. Georgia uses a phosphorus index risk assessment tool, and it was developed by uh, mainly our sole researchers using past research, data collection on runoff and risk factors. Um, and they've actually done some calibration research with it and our RP index seems to really be a valuable tool and be fairly accurate in um, evaluating the possible risk of nutrient <coughs> losses. Um, but it's really not related to the 590 standard at all. So the 590, does it use the same risk assessment? Yes. The five, all of the NRCS does use the Georgia phosphorus index. So it is a statewide tool used by the agency and all of our nutrient management planners in the state. Laura, you want to? Uh, sure. So prior to uh, this most recent revision of the 590 standard, Illinois didn't really have a, um, I guess what I'd consider a traditional P index. It, it had some um, guidelines based on soil type and uh, hydraulic group. Um, but we uh, just recently finished a, um, a weighted uh, factor system P index. It's very similar to other states around us like Kentucky and, and Pennsylvania. Um, and it uses a, an Excel worksheet that allows you to compare various um, conservation practices if the producer is willing to implement and he can see how that's going to really draw down his, his risk assessment um, for phosphorus um, given the, the Excel spreadsheet that was developed. Uh, another component, um, another one of the shells with the, the 590 standard is a look at the nitrogen leaching index. So my, my next question is, uh, how does your state address uh, nitrogen risk leaching uh, or nitrogen leaching risk assessment? Um, and how has that tool or that technique developed um, in this last couple of years? So I'll direct this question first <coughs> to, to Jim. Um, our nitrogen leaching index is, is similar in structure to uh, the phosphorus index. Uh, at, at that same time there in the, in the late 90s when we were looking at phosphorus, CSU was also doing some risk assessment, aquifer uh, risk assessments associated with nitrogen. So we do have some areas in the state with elevated uh, groundwater nitrates. So, kind of tying this, uh, our leaching index for planning, tying that back to the, uh, the aquifer vulnerability studies that CSU was working on and coming up with some factors that made sense that we could use for planning. And, and we adopted uh, you know, a, a nitrogen leaching index about the same time. It was about 2000 or so, 2001. 
Laura, can you talk about Illinois' approach to nitrogen leaching? Sure. Um, rather than a uh, nitrogen leaching index, which is what we started when the committee uh, was formed, we ended up with, I was just looking at the name of it, it's uh, the Nitrogen Management Guidelines. So the approach that Illinois took, um, instead of saying that we're not sure where the risk um, is for livestock or crop production in the state, we decided that we already know where nitrogen is coming from in the state. We know that it's coming from fields that are tiled and we know that there's a higher potential for nitrogen leaching whenever you have coarse soils. So basically we broke it down into two categories. If you have a field that is um, systematically tiled, so over 50% of that field is, is drained via tile drainage, um, then you're already a medium risk for nitrogen and in order to apply at certain rates you have to implement um, conservation practices or use a, a reduction, a rate reduction um, as management. Um, and on the flip side, if you have uh, a certain percentage of coarse soils and they, the Illinois NRCS provided us with a, a list of those um, soils that are of primary concern when it comes to nitrogen leaching, uh, then you also fall under a medium or a high risk depending on the soil type and have to go back and, and either implement conservation practices um, or um, reduce rate management. Um, and in the case of livestock specifically, you have to implement a cover crop or use a nitrogen inhibitor to apply at a, a, a nitrogen limiting rate um, for the next year's crop, or you have to use a P limiting rate for that next year's crop. Bonda, can you address nitrogen leaching in Washington? In Washington, we, uh, NRCS is Russell 2 is a water erosion predictor hydrology model. That is a recognized tool for nitrogen leaching. However, in Washington, we were fortunate to have a soil scientist that adapted, uh, made it more uh, quantitative, and so we actually have it in our web soil survey. So when you pull a web soil survey, survey report, one of the reports that you can get is a nitrogen leaching index, and so it will trigger you know what your losses are with it. So. Um, this was a topic of, of discussion at one of our face-to-face -face meetings. Georgia hasn't done much with nitrogen leaching in, in the past, and how our state conservationist decided to go about it was he looked at Georgia soils and looked at the inlet model. And what he found is that we really don't have the soil types or the risk factors that other states do. And basically our standard says that you need to manage nitrogen so that um, it is prevented from moving through the so soil profile. So it's very gen generic, um, but we never allow anybody to over apply nitrogen above the agronomic rate, so. Any other unique adaptations or approaches used for nitrogen leaching index that our audience would like to bring forward. This was a, you know, a somewhat new component to this year, uh, to this particular 590 okay. This next question is very regional in nature, and it's, uh, does your state have any unique options for winter spreading and why? And if you uh, look through that summary document that Nicole put together, it's, it's kind of interesting as to when and, and how winter spreading is allowed and under what conditions. Let's get the easy one out of the way first. Winter, what's winter? <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't have any requirements in our 590 standard or in our nutrient management planning implementation. I mean, we just say do not apply on saturated soils, and that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, in Washington, actually, um, we're looking at what Whatcom County is doing in um, Washington because they are probably more advanced in looking at this. They have uh, a less of a winter than most of the places in the state. They sometimes have, uh, you know, can do an application in February because they actually have a growing crop, where typically in most of the West that isn't uh, the case. Um, there are state water quality um, control authorities are really careful at, at what we decide on this one. But typically we've just had a technical note that kind of gives you the guidance about you know, the saturated, you know, frozen soils, snow cover, and it had some limitations there. So 
we may be revising it just a little bit, but typically we just have that. Um, the guidance is just pretty general. Jim, you want to talk about Colorado's approach to this? Um, sure. <clears throat> the state of Colorado has not too many restrictions with regard to winter spreading at the state itself, the uh, Department of Public Health and Environment. And the, uh, you know, at least in, for the combined animal feeding regs. Um, and there, there are some restrictions though by livestock class. Uh, the swine industry is, is regulated uh, more so than uh, the beef industry. So there were more restrictions there. And then if you go to the biosolids, part of this, um, there's more restrictions for the biosolids and swine than there are for feed. So stepping back and, and um, this, this revised standard, uh, national standard, had some uh, criteria in there for winter spreading. Whatever uh, tool or method that you were going to use to determine whether it was appropriate to spread in the winter had to address uh, there was some slope, but cover. There's there's a list of, of factors there. So we're in a situation where, according to for an NRCS plan, you couldn't apply in the winter unless you had worked something out with the state, and in our case with the EPA biosolids uh, coordinator in Region Eight. Um, so we, I don't know, we sat down and talked about it, and it's okay. Well, we've got these revisions to the phosphorus index we've got this tool and it covers this criteria that's that's uh, itemized in the in the national 590 standard for winter spreading so okay well we've got this already in place we're not going to invent something else and so for plans that NRCS is responsible for if you score a low risk on on the phosphorus index you're good for winter spreading and that that allows us to, uh, uh, in, in the NRCS plans that are developed based on the NRCS standard, that allows us to spread in, in the winter. And we still have to be, uh, you know, the state has setbacks, setback requirements from uh, surface water resources, and, and our, our cooperators have to adhere to those state regs, and then they would have to hit a, a green light or low risk on the phosphorus index and then go forth and apply. Are there any differences between solid and liquid manure? Yes. Um, for uh, liquids, in, uh, liquids are, are regulated uh, more so by the state than, than solids. Laura. Uh, sure. Current regulation in Illinois states that uh, you can winter apply on snow covered um, it doesn't say anything about saturated soils currently in the LMFA, but it says that you can apply on snow-covered ground uh, as long as there's less than 5% slope uh, and adequate erosion control. However, with the, the new 590 standard, NRCS bumped it up a notch uh, regardless of, of slope uh, or adequate erosion control in place. They say you cannot apply on, uh, you cannot surface apply and leave it unincorporated on snow covered or saturated soils, uh, unless there is some conservation practice you're willing to implement like a cover crop that re reduce the, the movement of nutrients uh, from that land application area. The next question that we um, have for our panel, um, whenever we review both the Kind of pre reviewed what the panels were looking at, or panel states were looking at, and then what we heard back from a lot of the other states across the country uh, in regards to unique plans for air quality is that there's, there are very few um, revisions or adaptations to the national standard related to air quality. Uh, we do suspect this would be a bit more of a regional topic, especially in the, in the years to come. Does any of our panel members want to address any? Uh, unique discussions on air quality. I guess I just know that um, working um, pretty unilaterally with EPA, they're going to have a stronger approach on making sure that they're addressing the Clean Air Act. So the air quality um, is going to be coming faster than we expect. 
um, just like water quality, air quality is going to be definite in the future. So um, the sooner that we can do this with air quality in this standard, we decided to incorporate an air um, quality risk assessment at the same time as coming out with the standard as you know, uh, the phosphorus index and the nitrogen leaching index. Just to put that, um, I guess the ideas out there with planners with, you know, to notice, you know, what things that can be done for odors or the greenhouse gases. Does anyone from the, the audience have any additional comments related to air quality <coughs> and the 590 standard? The, uh, the last question that we wanted to, to bring up to our panel, and then we are going to turn it to the rest of the audience, is what are the needs for the next iteration of the 590? Kind of looking five years into the future, what are some issues that maybe came up in your group discussions or the revisions this year that really couldn't be answered, couldn't be answered as fully as you'd like, um, or as scientifically maybe as you'd like, or as the group in general, like the state group in general would like? Uh, what do you see as some issues that might come up uh, as we move along? Melanie, you want to start that one? Well, I mean, there's been discussion about regional phosphorus indices and stuff like that, which you know, I think we're probably a long ways away from something like that, but that's a topic of discussion that's been coming up in our area. Um, modifying RP index to add certain best management practices and stuff like that, trying to beef up our phosphorus index a little bit. Um, and we do have discussions on the air quality issues um, in our 590 standard, but like currently ours is very generic and I can foresee us looking at maybe beefing that up a little bit in our future 590 standards. Um, that's about it. Laura? Uh, sure, one of the, the main topics that came out of the, the revisions of the 590 standard is there's a, a big push right now in Illinois to consider tile drainage. Um, and for Illinois this is a, a fairly new phenomenon, I guess. It's, it's been monitored in Iowa for years and years and years, but we don't have a lot of research in Illinois uh, that shows what's coming out of the tile lines. Um, and they went as far as to include in our P index, there's a leaching component for soluble phosphorus when organic um, fertilizer or manure is, is applied to fields. So if you have a tile system in place, uh, you're going to get a very high risk rating for that soluble P uh, to move through the tile system, where if you don't have tile in place, you get a, a, a very low, you get a zero for that, that criteria. Um, so in, in response to that, uh, there's, there's going to be a lot of monitoring, on-farm monitoring uh, from the, the private sector uh, in Illinois over the next two or three years to try and quantify uh, what's leaving the tile system for both commercial fertilizer and uh, hopefully organic and, and manure. Uh, that is applied to land application areas so that we can go back and, and hopefully sure up some of the assumptions that were made in the development process of these tools. Uh, in addition, Illinois uh, doesn't have, a, our Illinois EPA doesn't have a, um, an NPDES permit program that's as extensive as our surrounding neighbors. So we're in the process of, of developing a new CAFO rule. We just came out of it, the first comment period on it. Um, the other thing that's going to happen with this 590 standard, as soon as that new CAFO rule gets agreed upon and IEPA issues it, uh, the updates that are in that CAFO, the more stringent requirements will be adopted as far as setbacks and, and other specific requirements for producers will be adopted into the, uh, the 590 standard. I kind of got. I kind of have to split that into two different parts. There's the the standard or the planning criteria the part of, of it, and then there's what we need to do in the state to support nutrient management planning. Uh, so there is kind of two different things in terms of the national standard. Um, boy, I don't know. It needs to be shorter. It needs to be cleaner and simpler and easier to read and understand. Um, that's the standard part. And as far as what we need to do here in Colorado, um, 
nitrogen and phosphorus mineralization. Um, the rates that we're using uh, are not all derived from research that was conducted here in the state. We we pulled uh, nitrogen mineralization rates uh, in from from work that was done in in other states. Some of this primarily uh, California, and what we're finding is that um, if if we get into a system where we're cutting it close and we're applying organics and we're coming up short on nitrogen. We're coming up short in a lot of cases on phosphorus. And so we need, we need to step back and adjust these mineralization rates so that they work for us here. We've already made a few tweaks in, in some of the higher mountain areas where we get up in and we're drier and higher than we are here in, in the Denver area. And, and we've decreased that nitrogen mineralization rate down to where we can, it, it, it's, it's fitting better with what we're seeing on the ground, okay? Where we're cutting it close. Um, in terms of phosphorus, um, we've got a lot of different sources of organic phosphorus materials um, that are being generated brought in and generated here within the state and <clears throat> trying to adopt phosphorus source coefficients from the eastern part of the country is, has been a real challenge so we're, we're trying to get some help to uh, work on these p source coefficients for the various types of materials that we're working here so that when we get into a situ situation where we're cutting it close we're not leaving these guys hanging and short on the nutrients that they need for their systems. So I mean, that's, that's kind of the two different things that we need to do. One's the, on the standard side, and the other is what we need to do here locally with uh, the land grant extension, uh, trying to get this worked out on phosphorus source coefficients. That's been kind of a, uh, that's a challenge. Being short of phosphorus isn't something that you, that you hear a lot of. <laughs> well, and, and we've got we've got some different soils, you know, where you get into situations where you've got better than three and four percent free uh, free lime calcium carbonate. Um, we boy, there's there's some runoff studies that that uh, CSU has worked on where they're loading this stuff up 90 tons a year, 90 tons a year, and they cannot get the soil test P to budge. So I, we, we've got some different situations in different parts of the state, and depending on climate and temperature, how quick things happen. If it's dry and cold, things don't happen very fast. If you've got a bunch of calcium carbonate in the system, uh, we've got phosphorus that just it doesn't show up. It occludes, and for a time, and, and there are some situations where you're starting to see those P level soil test P levels come up, but then you deal with that when when you're dealing with that crop. So I, it's a challenge for sure. We we depend heavily on on extension Colorado State University for helping us work through this, as well as uh, EPA Region Eight. This is another. Uh, there's a at one time they were bringing train loads of biosolids into Colorado from New York City and spreading them all over the Eastern Plains. And a lot of this stuff just, boy, you get it on these dry soils, uh, high calcium carbonate, and it just have, having trouble getting pee to show up in soil tests. I was going to say, I'm guessing there's a couple of states that wouldn't mind showing you something. <laughs> uh, Bonda. Um, I have to ditto what Jim says. Just not having, you know, all of our guidance comes from, you know, not the West. You know, we have more arid, we're colder, you know, the high, you know, um, calcium soils. So, we just need to have a little bit more research of what you know what those actual rates are going to for each state probably too. Uh, and another thing that the I guess the nitrogen the 590 addresses a little bit more is biosolids. And although some of the states have a pretty good strong program on biosolids, we see the use of those um, being you know more apparent. And so I think there needs to be a little bit more research about you know, the biosolids also. Um, also, I just have to put this plug in. Um, the Langer University guidance that's, that's recommended in the standard is, um, I guess, 
I have to say that I had um, one of our land grant universities that was offended that it had to be, I think it mentions it 12 times in the standard, and they don't have um, the staff to keep up on all the guidance as much as they did before, and that we they felt that we're more or less misusing the fertilizer guides a little bit because those fertilizer guides are meant as a guide, not as a checkbook that, you know, this is minus, you know, three is this, two is, you know, it's not, it's meant as a general guide under perfect conditions. And so what what that management guy, what the management the guys are doing out there is sometimes has to be at that, you know, that great conditions in order to get that, that you know, that application. So I think that we are, I guess you cautioned us on misusing um, the Land Grant University guidance for fertilizer guides too, you know, so strict. Um, and also um, another thing that we're addressing a little bit more of the com commercial fertilizer is we're looking at doing a phosphorus and a, and a nitrogen leaching index on commercial fertilizer applications also. Specifically in our blues, there are 30% slopes. And uh, the only obstacle that we have is that we're trying to encourage no-till. So a lot of times applications, you know, sometimes don't fit real well with, with uh, no-till. You know, you have less options, I guess you'd say. So that's one of the things I'd like to see a little bit more information on. Have a couple of extra minutes. Um, is there any question from the audience or any of our panel members? For one or more of our panel members? Uh, I'd be interested, you know, we're assigned to strategic conservation solutions. Um, as we look into the future on 590, how do you get the 590 standards at the state and national level to be more dynamic as it interrelates with new technologies? Uh, we have a, a series of, uh, of fertilizer enhancers, we have manure amendments, we have precision application technologies, all of which allow us to, to be much more precise on, on how we, we manage the nutrients, whether they're commercial or, uh, or manure-based nutrients. But then when the 590 translates to equipment cost share, or to CSP cost share, it, it's not ready to make that leap. So, how do we how do we bring that whole system along? Yeah. You, you need to get a hold of the program person <laughs> by the ear. <laughs> no, I, I I think there's plenty of room for uh, the techn technological advances within. The framework of, of this planning criteria that we've got but when you get to the programmatic side and 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 what they decide they want to cost share that doesn't necessarily go back to the technical aspects of the planning criteria i i did the, i i really appreciate the, the guidance the grid that you all did and i did a very similar one on csp on amendments and enhancers and uh there's a lot of treatment of things like um, inhibitors, treating nitrogen inhibitors as a generic term when it's actually fertilizer enhancers because there's three different modes of actions and when you write into the standards an inhibitor, you exclude, exclude others. Uh, CSP has almost no relationship in its application standards enhancements to manure amendments and we desperately sorting through all the manure amendments that are out there to, to tell did they make a difference on phosphorus and nitrogen leaching movement each of each of those things. I guess the only caveat is is we push it through air quality enhancements or energy enhancements instead of the nutrient or water quality ones. So we kind of push it in a different way and kind of sometimes programs haven't caught up and they don't know that realm yet so they kind of they just let anything kind of go through right now so we're kind of doing it that way with some of some of those um, payment scenarios and stuff so in Illinois I, I know that that was the primary reason for for um, the adaptive management uh, guidelines it's it's still pretty restrictive on on what some producers can do but it still allows them to try new innovative techniques that fits into their operation um, and, and allows some flexibility between that producer and NRCS um, if he does go into an equip or, or other type of contract. So uh, at least Illinois is, is making a step forward to where producers can try innovative um, practices 
with their operation. Um, I know we can use, or they're actually pushing um, nitrogen inhibitors. Again, we did call it an inhibitor, um, which goes back to your prior comment, um, but they are pushing the use of that with uh, manure, even though there's not a lot of, I guess, in Illinois data that, that backs up some of those products. Um, I will say that we, in order to use a product in Illinois, it's got to be certified through the Illinois Department of Agriculture. So you can't just go out and, and, and buy some, some product at a farm show and, and go to NRCS and say, I want to use this because the sales guy says that I get a 15% a yield boost um, by adding it when I apply my, my manure. You won't be able to do that in Illinois. Uh, you still have to go off a list that's, that's certified through the IDOA. In, in Georgia, um, I think it's a very state specific issue because you know you have your state programs and they decide what is the most important things going on. And the, our state has a technical a technical information committee that they meet on a regular basis and they look at what's out there and they look at what's going on, um, latest and greatest technology. And if we see something that's going on in our state or a need, then they'll address that through the technical committee. So I think it's a very state specific issue. Mark? In the, do any of the panel members, I guess, have any data or studies that, that have shown the nutrient management plans are actually changing manure application rates and influencing water quality in, in your states? I mean, it seems like we're changing standards and doing all this, and, and I don't know how much documented evidence is out there that the nutrient management plan workers, social scientists involved that have looked at adoption rate. Great question. Yeah, I, I know that C, CEAP has a lot of studies on our conservation practices and the effects, so I would kind of Google it and see what they would have on that. Because it, it would be more to the research like you're talking about, but yeah, we just um, don't have a lot of you know we don't you know in NRCS we don't go back out there and check on things because we're thinking that we're reducing whatever we're doing we're meeting the producers' goals and we're trying to treat the resource concerns, but we don't do it to maybe the level of a regulatory person that says no runoff or zero tolerance. So we're because we're adding those other practices in as the system, and so we don't have just the one thing sometimes. Personally, I think that's a flaw that's in the system. Um, these producers are encouraged to get nutrient management plans. And in the, the case of Illinois, um, a lot of the producers in Illinois volunteer to have nutrient management plans developed for their operation, but there's no feedback on those nutrient management plans, right? They're not nutrient management experts. So they're, they really rely on the consultants, the TSPs and NRCS in the state to tell them what rates they need to apply, um, but maybe they're not Maybe it's, it's up to us as extension or other industry personnel to, to offer that feedback service. Um, again, the only, the only information we have in Illinois is, is uh, how many producers on a percentage basis has a nutrient management plan and how often they're updating that plan. But as far as how well that plan performs for their operation, I think that's a, a serious piece of the puzzle that's, that's missing, uh, not only in our state, but, but in other states. I, I really appreciate the, the panel coming in today and sharing their uh, their thoughts and their, their insights from what's going on in their states and in their regions.